Japanese bases in the South Pacific, Giant Liberator and Mitchell bombers, piloted by United States and Australian airmen, launch one of the heaviest air blows in this far distant theater of war. Air power paving the way for United Nations infantry. Thousand pound bombs plunging through humid tropic air to explode upon an enemy air base in a series of fantastic fire rings. Transports and landing boats loaded with troops make for shore. Typical of the warfare being waged in the South Pacific is this amphibious assault by combined United States and Australian forces. supplies only six miles from a major Japanese air base. Troops in the mottled green camouflage of the jungle establish another beachhead from which to dislodge the enemy. Tons of heavy equipment landed at this one point testifies to the magnitude and thoroughness of General MacArthur's newest offensive. Trucks rumble over roads freshly cut through the jungle. Giant tractors and steam shovels are carving new aerodromes out of the wilderness. Big 155 millimeter guns are hauled into position until they're well within range of the Japanese. Camouflage scouts push ahead to pick off Japanese snipers. This is but a sample of how American forces are fighting in the South Pacific. San Francisco's huge Chinatown comes a steady flow of patriotic Americans of Chinese descent, eager to register for work in vital wartime industries. At one California shipyard, more than 500 skilled workers, men and women, are helping build the United Nations ever-expanding merchant marine. chefs prepare native dishes for those who prefer Chinese food. A taste of the old China while working to help free the land of their fathers. Sweden's Gunder Haig is taking home his own camera record of his first visit to America. Scenes such as America's national sport, a big league baseball game at Boston's Fenway Park, Visiting historic shrines, the great Swedish athlete is the center of admiring youngsters. Gunder's hobby is his interest in youngsters. Training and developing boys to be outstanding athletes is his greatest ambition. Someday, he wants to establish a model sports school in his native Sweden, a school where boys can achieve true physical perfection. He plans sports arenas and dormitories to house and train the youth of his land. American youngsters get the thrill of their lives, keeping pace with the world's greatest distance runner. Here in Harvard Stadium, Gunder Haig adds a new record to his brilliant crown. Clocked in four minutes, five and three tenths seconds, the Swedish champion turns in the fastest mile ever run outdoors in America. American troops of General Patton's 7th Army move swiftly through western Sicily, taking town after town as they drive to join General Montgomery's British 8th Army. Through captured Tramini, Mersala, Trapani, Palermo, scenes are the same. 
More than 50,000 Axis prisoners surrender in the first three weeks of the campaign. American wounded, awaiting removal to North Africa, lie shaded from the sun beneath the wings of giant air transports. Planes that ferry supplies from North Africa become flying ambulances for the return trip. To date, United States war casualties, comparatively, are the lowest in history. Planes like this, that rush wounded from base hospitals in the field, contribute much to that record. Although the skies are clear of enemy planes, the huge transports take no chances as they barely skim the waves to avoid possible attack. War planes on a mission of mercy, speeding southward over the Mediterranean. North African bases, British and American air forces prepare for the most delicate air mission ever attempted, the bombing of Rome, capital and arsenal of Axis Italy. For weeks, crews study detailed charts of the city. Maps carefully marked are memorized. Holy shrines, churches and hospitals are specifically designated with circles and crosses. Orders are, these non-military objectives must not be damaged, but military targets alongside must be blasted. Pilots, navigators, and bombardiers, selected for their perfect record in precision bombing, swarm over the Mediterranean. 500 huge bombers in wave after wave. Below lies Rome. The planes follow the River Tiber, winding around strategic railroad yards and war plants. The Italians have been warned by leaflets dropped from Allied planes. Now, bombs. To ensure greater accuracy, the raid is made in broad daylight from only 10,000 feet. And the great Axis rail yards from which troops and supplies are poured into southern Italy are blasted by overwhelming Allied air power. There is no doubt the bombing of the fascist capital hastened the fall of Benito Mussolini. has come. The criminal, corrupt, fascist regime in Italy is going to pieces. Mussolini came to the reluctant conclusion that the jig was up. He could see the shadow of the long arm of justice. Our terms to Italy are still the same as our terms to Germany and Japan. Unconditional surrender. <laughs> 